this is kind of a informal um, me copy and pasting a couple of figures from the previous presentation, the one on Monday, and just kind of giving it a little more context or doing it just a little bit review, focusing on, on the things that seem to be confusing. Uh, so, so just to just to review, the one thing I did that may have seemed a little weird, it was kind of a leap I made was I chose to simulate these biological rings using these pairs of units. And like my the philosophy there is that um, artificial units and neurons, uh, artificial, sorry, artificial units and neural networks are already not neurons. They're they're already non-biological. -bi it's it's not like they're if, if you draw an analog between neural networks and biological neural networks, it's unlikely that that the, the right connection is that a neuron is a neuron. Like it, if if there is a similarity between them, that's not the right abstraction level. And so I just decided to embrace that and do something even more extreme and model an entire ring of neurons using a pair of activations that can be uh, positive or negative. So, so let's be uh, a couple of quick things right away. First of all, uh, the, a pair of neurons, um, it, it, someone has to read out from that pair of neurons, right? I mean, it's like each A and B are, are need, you only when you look at them together do you get do you get a behavior that's somewhat similar to um, uh, the ring, right? But is that correct, right? Correct. Yes. But but to really stimulate the ring, uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine how a neuron could read out something from A and B because um, I mean, it, oh, I'm going to try to understand it. When I think about a ring and a ring, I can oh, there's a set of neurons that are actively firing in in succession, right? They're they're it's it's it, they're, they're, that ring is consisted of a bunch of neurons and they're taking turns. Here, I can, I guess I'm struggling with. Okay, yeah, I, I can see how the A and B combined mathematically in some sense uh, would link uh, to if you could read them out together, they would lead to a result. But you, but no neuron could read out that result from A and B, right? It, it's like um, but the, there there is an easy answer to this. And yeah. in the artificial world, you can do it with a pair of weights if the weights are allowed to be positive or negative. But but a single neuron meeting those weights would only represent um, uh, one point on the ring, right? I'd have to have a, I still have to have a set of neurons, each one reading out A and B at, at, with different weights, right? So I don't have a ring until I have oh. a set of neurons reading out A and B. I, I'm, I'm saying that a single readout neuron, I could put a, a C unit up here, and, and I could have that C activate only when the activation's right here on the ring, but only when the activation's here by to, by giving C the right yes, weight. Yes, yes. Okay. I, first of all, I've not seen your cursor. Um, oh, oh, the cur Zoom's being weird. Here, here I'm going to switch to, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to stop sharing, but I'm going to switch to showing. Um, I, I think we're in agreement. I, I just... I just yeah, want to be clear. I understand. Uh, now you can probably see my cursor, and I'm just going to show it. Like yeah. Um, okay. So, so yeah. Okay. So yeah, I was saying a C unit could read these out, and, and here I'm I'm in artificial neural network land. Yeah. yeah. Talking about this, the C could could read out any point on this ring by choosing different pairs of weights on the A and B. Yeah. All right. So, but to to to. Uh, to achieve the same thing as a ring attractor, which has, in this case, what, you know, um, it has 10 neurons. I'd have to have 10 neurons reading out from A and B, right? So- That would be I, one way to do that, yes. Okay, so I, I'm just pointing out that A and B are sort of the um, uh, the basis or the, what you, if you take A and B, you can create a set of ring, or ring attractor by having a bunch of neurons attached to A and B, but on their own, A and B do not, are not, it's not a ring attractor. On A and B, you could create a ring attractor, maybe. Is that right? Correct. Um, okay. So, um, so just using this, just saying I have A and B doesn't mean I have a ring attractor yet. I still have to have a set of neurons that are going to read from A and B. Um, and then the next question is, it, when we talk about the ring, there, you know, it, it's a simple assumption that's a one D grid cell module. Is that right? Is that is that how you're thinking of it? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. I, I mean, to be explicit, it's it. Yeah. Yes. That's roughly what it is. Yeah. To be explicit, to be called a grid cell, it has to have certain firing properties. So, but yes, it, it is basically the underlying substrate of a 1D grid cell module. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's the way you have it here, there wouldn't be any uh, phase uh, 
uh, precession or something like that, right? True. And yeah. so I could have showed the um, the velocity controlled oscillator version of this. You could substitute this figure yeah. for a velocity yeah. controlled oscillator. So so okay. So 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 now I'm I, I'm not so this is good. I like this, but I'm not sure what you why you going to this abstraction of the A and B cell. Um, uh, what did you gain anything that, or is this a way of maybe bringing it back into the world of of, um, of mini comp? Uh, I, what I did that purely because this lets me use this as a machine learning technique. Uh, uh, that, that lets me I can. Th th this is this is something I can do as an unsupervised learning algorithm. Where I w here we have two two sets of motivations. I want to find a good unsupervised learning algorithm that does useful things and teaches mm -hmm. us something grid cells. So I've drawn this big correspondence where when we want to live in biology land, we might think like this. But when we want to think of like unsupervised learning of data, we might use this because we can, you know, run back propagation and stuff on it. Okay. All right. So it's just a way of your, 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 the main thing you're doing is saying, okay, these ring attractors are kind of wonky biological things maybe. Um, but here's a machine learning equivalent that lets me work in a machine learning world. With that yes. Model. Yeah, that's okay. what it is. Hmm. But I, mean, again, I, I don't know if this will be relevant, but the right the the right hand side couldn't really do unions, um, but the left hand side could do a little bit of unions. So so that's that's true, but I guess the um but we may not that, be relying kind, on that. It's, anyway. it's kind of by design here. I'm I'm yeah. treating the core building block of these algorithms as these rings that can't do unions, these rings that have a phase and a firing rate and nothing else, or a phase yeah. and a magnitude mm -hmm. and nothing else. Okay, so um, okay, so now you basically said, okay, there's a, here's an equivalent thing to a ring of trial. Well, it, it's equivalent if I had ten neurons leading out from me, um, but it, it, I, I could learn. It could learn to do uh, that function. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and I can do everything to this. I can do path integration to it. I can per I can perform updates on this by uh, you know multiplying it in a careful way it, it does require care some carefulness but 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 anything this can do this can do okay and um so okay the the second point i made here is so i i you know i built a ring i, I built a network on this idea uh and as as we talked about we, it led to these linear filters it led to these units responding to basic sine waves oriented sine waves um, but an important an important qualification here and really the second and third bullet point go together i got these filters because i used a linear mapping uh, because i used a very basic network in a sense the only solution this network could have possibly found was sine waves uh, the, the the only solution that that, ma that meets this objective where the rings translate linearly uh, can, you, the, the, can, you, can you go through this network again? See, so we're showing yeah. we have we have a bunch of rings, and they're feeding into. Uh, and then you have a bunch of neurons that are getting pixels, and they're feeding into the rings. Yeah. But but we're learning the pick the this these these uh, these neurons are actually learning to be filtered, right? So at this point, the rings aren't even contributing. There's, you're only showing it. You're only showing information go from those from those neurons to the rings. Uh, uh, Right. Oh, wow. So the, the thing being learned is this linear mapping. And the thing being optimized is that I want these rings to update smoothly. And in, in, but, uh, you, you also have a reconstruction objective? Yes, that's true. As well. So how, how does that, is there a decoder on top of this? Or how, yeah. how is there? there? There's a decoder. And I went with um, a trivial solution of taking this linear mapping and using its transpose as the decoder. And that worked well enough for this purpose. Okay. Uh, I ha I've I've experimented a little bit with a separate decoder, but I didn't go very far with that. I guess there's a lot of steps here in this second image, which I'm just uh, I'm missing. Um, right. Uh, yeah. I, I, I obviously you're, you're 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 trying to learn a where well, you're learning you're learning these filters on these um, in this rectangular box of neurons. And, but you're also, tr but your, your constraint is that you have to have smooth progression in the in the ring attractors. Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, but but that's not you're not showing the feeding back into the into the filters, right? You must be. Well, that that's that's basically it's um it, that's the loss function. It, then back propagation. Okay. So we're not showing the back propagation. 
information, but just showing after it's learned, it would, it would work like this. Yeah, but that, that would be true of almost any feed forward network. And I know, I know, but I, this doesn't look like a typical network. And so, I'm, you know, I, I, when I think about neurons, I always think like oh, you're showing the connection, that's the only way it moves. So, yeah. Yeah, so there is a, a backprop operation Yes. That, that, and so some, I don't understand how this works yet, but you're saying the, the, the ring attractors are really are A, B cells. Um, uh, I think that's what you're saying. It is yeah, A, B cells. This is an A and a B. This is another A and a B. Oh, 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 I didn't see that. No, oh, I didn't get that. Uh, okay. Um, okay, let me think about this now. Um, oh, that was not obvious from the drawing, I'm sorry. Um, it wasn't obvious to me. Um, I didn't make that connection. I, I was somehow to assume that the AB cells were just part of the ring attractor, and you're just you're showing it's a ring attractor, but the AB cells were up there someplace. But no, this is really literally these are the AB cells. Yeah. And and um, and and so those ring attractors, that's those are just those are actually one cell in the same ring. Is that right? Um, so remember I said you had to have 10 sort of cells to, 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 that were reading the AB cells to make a ring attractor. So these, these are like, you're showing three of those, is that right? Um, like the first two cells lead to one neuron in one position in the ring and the next two cells lead to another position in the ring and so on. Is that yeah. right? The, these uh, are three, yeah, these are three different rings. But, but completely the, different rings. Oh, they're, wait a minute. Okay, now I'm confused again. Sorry, I must've misunderstood. There are three okay. different the A, B cells themselves are not a ring. So you, to have a ring, you have to have 10 cells reading them out in your drawing. You, know, you have to have 10 cells that are looking at the A, B. And so, uh, okay, so, the, so, so these three rings are three different rings. There's 10 cells in each ring. Each cell is learning a set of connections. So it's a set of A, B cells. So if I look on the left there, the first one of the three, there's, a, there's gonna be like 10 cells in the ring and each one's gonna be looking at AB forming the correct weights so that it looks like a ring. Um, uh, that's, but that do you actually have, you don't actually have those cells, right? Correct. You're just I, drawing I, I, it as I, if you had them. The, these 10 cells don't actually exist. In, in some but they could, they could exist. If, yeah, they could. Right, yeah. You're, you're, aren't you? The, the fundamental thing, the fundamental building block I'm using is is actually, um, sorry, I'm doing this on the fly. Uh, take it here, I'm gonna resize that, and just <laughs> move it. Um, that did not work at all. Uh, here we do, demo fail. It's gonna take a second. So the fundamental building block I'm using here, um, the, fun the fundamental thing is these abstract rings. I'm gonna remove these little, these little confusing gray dots. These abstract rings that have a phase and a magnitude. Um, and this is the fundamental thing. And this 10 unit, uh, um, this 10 unit ring right here is just one way of implementing this. This pair of units here is another way of implementing this. And, but, but abstractly, this is the fundamental thing. This isn't the fundamental thing. These 10 units aren't fundamental. This is. It's the, uh, the abstract thing I'm representing is this. If that helps. No, then okay. help me. Uh... I, th I think I'm making progress here, but I mean, it, ultimately you're trying, let me, see, let me try this. You're trying to come up with a, a way of training A and B. Is that correct? Yes, um, correct. Right, and- We're tra Training A and B's weights, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, well, a and, a and B's weights to some, well, there, there has to be weights to something. Uh, yeah. Is it weights to the pixels or is it weights to the ring? It's the pixels. There there okay. are no additional-, additional Okay, weights. okay, so you're, you're, you're trying to, each, each A and B unit is looking at a bunch of pixels. They're trying to um, learn how to respond to those pixels. You, in the end, you're gonna get these sort of Gabor-like filters. Um, and, and, and you're saying, well, what is the constraint that I'm applying on top of the A, B cells to, that would cause them uh, to learn? What is the, right? And so you're gonna be using some, this the thing you've shown as a ring, that is your constraint. Now it's not really a ring. You're telling me it's it's um, it's not a ring of cells, not a set of cells. I think you said it earlier. Something about um, smooth. Um, um, uh, so 
can you explain a little bit more what it is that the constraint is that you're enforcing on the A and B cells that they can run yeah, these filters? The, the constraint is that as a time series of inputs goes into the network, the rings should update their phases linearly. And so if I think about the A and B cells, that means the A and the B cells might have to be be like a sine and a cosine or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they're going up and down. Um, and um, so somehow that is your constraint. Um, as the inputs are changed, as the inputs are changing, you want that that intersection, the, the dot in the upper right hand corner, you want that to be smoothly going around the ring in some yeah. um, and and I don't and and so you are just is it like okay you're saying here's another input and I'm assuming that it's that the dot is moved and therefore what weights should A and B have and there's another input I assume the dot is moved again and what is something like that yes um, how did you end up with different scales for the different filters. Well, it's what? just what naturally happened. The, the reason that happens is because keep in mind, this is also optimizing reconstruction and error. error. And so that basically Backprop just discovered that using multiple scales leads to better reconstructions. So, but there must be some sort of competition then between the, the different sets of A and B cells. Otherwise, they have to know, otherwise they what would force them to create different filters. Um, and you're right. If, there has well, to be some. Backprop just kind of naturally does that with populations. It'll it'll make one part of the population. It'll it, it'll lead to some specialization. Because there's not there's not any benefit in two units representing the same thing. So whichever of them is doing a slightly better job will kind of take over. Oh, I see that, that part, and whatever's doing a slightly worse job will go and explore other filters it can use. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So that'll happen even without the ring constraint. Or... Yeah, I'd, I'd say what the ring constraint does is um, is it gives you these clusters of cells. It gives you these clusters of orientations and scales, where yeah. it, because because keep in mind as you already know, but just to just to say it again, these two filters, this this A and B reflects actually like in the in this interpretation it reflects a cluster of 10 cells with different translations mm. and um and so the, the clusterings is the thing that the ring gets you and and, and, it, and without the rings they're they're not these pretty gabors they're more like messy sort of gabors so so what is the um so why so i don't mean this to be snarky about this but so what is the what is it that gets you excited about this? What is what is it that, that you feel like you've accomplished here that that it's insightful? Um, it's the uh, yeah. I, I guess the 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 idea is, in a few words, representing novel environments using grid cells. All right. Now, how does that now? All right. So we haven't gotten there yet. So this is that that was in the, the Monday presentation, but not this one. This one so far, you say, okay, I just learned how to use this sort of. Um, um, smooth smooth movement of a theoretical sort of ring type of thing to train these input units mm -hmm. um, uh, so but but now how does that now lead to novel environments um, well here the the images that this is representing in the context of environments is object vector cells and boundary vector cells and those and the various vector cells essentially that is the image that I am representing the image you're representing the, the, the yeah i was confused a little bit about the actual input that's coming in um you say pixels but it, it's are you sort of always in the center of the image and yeah. as you're moving around things are coming closer to you and further away um, yes yeah. that's what's happening yes and and because it's in this these allocentric vector cells with the, that include boundary vector cells, object vector cells, uh, as you turn around, those are actually changing their, uh, their, so oh, it's, I see. It's okay. whether there's a boundary at a certain location relative to you, but in, a, okay. in an allocentric directional reference frame. So I'm sorry, right. 
uh, did you the input to the system was assumed to be these these object vector cells in this simulation yes and so how would i how would i interpret these filters and what does that what are those one of those filters mean so the, uh, this, this means uh, like i'll just zoom in on one of these um the, this means that um, I'm this unit's going to respond to something that is allocentrically to your left or allocentrically up and up up here uh -huh. to your northwest or uh -huh. allocentrically to your south. But it'll respond maximally if there's an actual diagonal. Yeah. If if so, if there's if there's literally a boundary going diagonally across the room right here, it's gonna make the cell respond vigorously. Okay. Um, and then, so all right. So, uh, so then, how do let's go back to the novel environments then? Uh, yeah. Uh, where does that come in? And I know I say, okay, here's an object vector cell that says, oh, I have some boundary off to diagonally to my left or anywhere along that line. Um, um, okay, fine. So that could fire anywhere, I suppose, right? Um, yeah. where, where does the novelty thing come into this then? Well, so, so any, um, any environment can be described as a set of boundary vector cells and object vector cells. Okay, fine. So it's it's like you're it's like you're create. Do you see the analogy to it's like you're painting a picture of the room? Yeah. I, well, I can imagine that the picture is composed of object vector uh, responses, right? Yeah. Um, but okay, but but that's just a picture. It's it's where. So now I have a new room that's novel. Mm -hmm. I'll represent it differently, right? You'll have a different representation. Yeah. Um, and it, that's all in the activations. You're not having to learn anything new in that new room. But wouldn't that be true? Uh, I mean, it, it, I wouldn't. I mean, I mean, if 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 a cell just says, "I'm going to respond whenever there's an object off at this diagonal space here," well, of course, it'll respond in novel environments too. So, what what's 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 surprising about that? It, it just says, "I see something over there." Um, um, It'd be like saying I'm looking at a picture and there's some pixels, you know, lines in the picture, and I say, "Well, here's a novel image, and there's a diagonal line off in this part of the image." Well, okay, fine, but I haven't generalized or anything. I'm just saying, "Yep, there's a, there's a, this new, several pictures have that diagonal line in it." Right. So what it's going to do is now you're going to be able to move around this room, and it's going to stay accurate. It, it's going to continue activating the proper grid cells. So that you can continue to anticipate, hey, there's a boundary over there, or there's an object over there, even after you move. I see. Uh, so it's not purely observational. Um, it's right. like saying, um, "All right, I'm, I'm in some spot in the room. I've got my picture of the room. Oh, yep, these are the boundaries around me. These are the objects around me." Obviously, if I go to a new spot and I just observe, I'll form another representation. So, yep, these are the objects. There are different positions around me. I have a different image. Um, but you're saying I could move to that new spot and uh, and not observe and yet predict what my, what my image would be. Yes. All right. So where does movement come into this, this, um, into this figure here? Well, movement is going to cause each ring to update at a certain rate. Now that's not, is that built into this network? We don't, there's no movement vectors here. There's no movement input at all in this thing, right? So is that a separate system that says, oh, we're just gonna assume that we have some way of taking movement to move ourselves around these rings. Is that, is that yeah. proper? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that is essentially, it's a separate system that I haven't shown. But, but yeah. the smoothness thing will sort of assume that whatever changes have, are expected to be smooth. Right. If you have the 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 loss you have for the for the rings, the fact that it has to be temporally smooth. Well, would work. Is, smooth is. I I might have messed up by using the word smooth, uh, but it, but it's. 
because it, it, it's like updating linearly. It's it, each each step needs to cause the bump to move. Oh. This amount, but it's so if the if smoothly. if you are randomly jumping around the environment, this would still work. There's Wait. no assumption that one input is temporarily. We, we have to know, to the you, previous you have input. to know how you move to get to the new spot in the environment, right? You have to have some knowledge of how you got there. Well, not in this network. That's what my question is. Well, it couldn't possibly work if you have no movement input. Then you wouldn't know where you're going to be. So, uh, okay, for Subutai, Subutai's point doesn't involve prediction yet. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Where Jeff do, does. Okay, uh, I missed that. So, so yeah, I mean, this is an unsupervised technique that as I've shown it, it didn't use movement yet. It just assumed that, um, it assumed that its input series is gonna tend to be straight lines through, um, through so, to put it one way, it's, it tends to be straight lines through some manifold and it's discovering that manifold. Or another way is that it's. But, but, but does the previous input impact the current input in any way? No. And it, no. And okay, so you could current. be randomly shuffled. You could randomly shuffle the inputs, um, and it would still work fine. Correct. It would work fine. Although if you randomly shuffled the inputs, it'd be do, do very poorly on the objective. But it wouldn't change the results of the. No, uh, sorry, I don't mean randomly shuffle the pixels. I mean randomly shuffle the temporal course of the images. So if you had. You know, image one, two, three, four, five. You could have just as well given it image three, then five, and then one, and then two. Yeah. So, so if if you're just doing inference, that's just going to cause these rings to hop around randomly. Uh, but that's going to be my, my be question is is, but in training, is there any value in the temporal course of the inputs? Y yes, because the it's it's objective like its objective is literally that it wants the the distance from here to here to be the same distances from here to here and the same as from here to here and so if you scramble the inputs it's going to be just a bunch of i'm using the word distance but like the the phase the the, the, the change in phase should be the constant and within this module for for a sequence of inputs Okay, so there is a temporal uh, factor in the loss function. Yes, during learning time. Okay, that, that was my question. Is, uh, okay, but it has to be constant velocity essentially at this point. Yes, I gave my, I made this the easy version of the experiment basically. Okay. Once it's true random walks, it becomes more difficult, but I think still doable. But yes. So going uh, on the topic of, yeah, on the topic of Jeff's, I'm, I'm intentionally um, to designing a system where, where we have a natural place to put in movement commands. The natural place to put in movement commands is you update these rings using Yes, them. yes, but, okay. Uh, but, I, but I have not done that yet. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me try rephrasing this entire exercise in different language and see if this encapsulates what you're talking about. So um, I walk into a room and I've never been in this room before. And I look around the room and somehow through my sensory inputs, I build up a set of object vector cells for the room. Um, now I, I'm going to move to a new spot in the room and, um, and uh, I want I, I, I want to be able to calculate what the, the new object vector cells will be in that new location in the room as opposed to just observing it. So that's a prediction. I'm saying, okay, I'm going to move over here and I move from one corner of the room to the other corner of the room. What will be my representation of the room in object vector cells? Now we can do this, right? I can mentally do this. I can walk in the room, the new room, look around, sort of understand the room. Then I could just imagine what, would, what, what would be my perception of the room from a different, from a different corner. And I can do that. I can mentally do that exercise. So this is a way of saying, here's a, a, a potential mechanism for how you might do that. How you might say, okay, former representation for one part of the room. Now 
now uh, move or pretend to move or think you're going to move to another part and predict what the representation will be from that part of the room. Uh, and this is a mechanism we'll do that. And now, um, is that correct? Yes. Okay, now the way I've, this is clearly something we have to be able to do. And my assumption in the past would have been something like, well, we must form a representation of the room using a reference frame and we assign different objects at different displacements in, the, in this reference frame. And, um, and now I you know my, I moved to a new location in the reference frame. Uh, and then from that new location, I can um, uh, um, build up a set of um, object vector cells building my model of the room. And that's a bit hand waving, um, but that's how I would have thought about it. Um, but you're saying here, this is, this is perhaps a very a sort of different mechanism to achieve the same result that's, that's somehow much simpler. Um, would that be correct? Yeah, that's correct. There, there, there are two ways of approaching the problem. And I, and I even, I, I feel like this would be too big of a topic, but I can actually draw a link between, I can draw a direct connection between how this solves that problem and how the, dis, how the displacement cells version solves the problem and how they're actually kind of um, the same. I, I have a unifying theory in my head about why, how those two are the same, uh, how, how I am, um, how, how those are at core, a similar problem. Yeah, but, you know, I think that would be very useful. You know, as I've been thinking about these issues, it's, it's really complex, of course, and there's all these steps you have to go to, to solve these problems, you know, like, oh, well, I'm dealing with, you know, uh, movements are going to be in e egocentric reference frames and, and uh, we have changes you know, in orientation and that from what I observe is in this egocentric frame, but I have to turn into these allocentric, you know, object cells, object vector cells, just all these steps involved that are very complex. And, and, uh, and so it's enticing to say, oh, maybe there's a shortcut to achieve the whole thing, right? You know, I'm not sure that's what you're saying, but it's what it sounds like. Um, there might be a much simpler way of achieving these results. And that's really appealing, <laughs> but I, 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 I don't yet sort of have a deep understanding of it in the way that I have a deep understanding of grid cells and grid cell modules. Um, it's sort of like, okay, you said all these things, it kind of makes sense. There's a lot of abstractions, which I'm just, you know, I haven't internalized yet. And, and somehow it just magically works. And it's just like, okay, that's really great. I don't understand it. I mean, I, I, you walked through it, but I don't deeply understand it. I, don't, I couldn't explain it to somebody. Um, but I wanna make sure that I'm understanding what you're proposing. It's an alternate way of, of at least going from one allocentric representation to another allocentric representation based on some sort of probably allocentric movement that just that basically converts object vector cells to object vector cells. Um, and so I could you could think of it this way, giving a set of object vector cells plus a allocentric movement, what's my next alloc uh, object vector cells? Yeah. Okay. I think if you phrase the problem up front that I mean, that's a subset of everything has to happen, right? It's clearly a subset. How do we get the allocentric representation? How do we get these object vector cells? All these things that are like, okay. But, but at least you could just, if you'd phrased it that way, it would help for me at least. Um, um, you know, it's like, hey, it reminds me of, we saw uh, whose paper it was. Um, we did a review of a paper, remember I did it. And at the end, it was this big, there was a figure that occupied an entire page. And they were showing how um, you could do a mapping between um, egocentric and allocentric vector cells uh, with orientation. And you might remember it was like a big grid. Um, so down the left side was like the egocentric object cells and the, the, and the horizontal axis was ob uh, allocentric object vector cells. And then they had orientation coming in from the side and they routed, they showed they could have a routing mechanism. I don't know if anyone remembers it figure um, I could find the paper. But anyway, they were trying to convert between egocentric and allocentric vector cells. Um, and this is a paper they're arguing that there was that there was um, uh, complementary egocentric vector cells and, uh, as well as object uh, allocentric vector cells. And so this that was like a transform. And I was and it's like, oh that's something like that has to happen here. This is another type of transform. This is saying, okay, I've got a bunch of 
allocentric vector cells. Or, and I have an allocentric movement, and now I'm going to get another set of uh, allocentric vector cells to represent my new movement. I suppose this would work if I was doing it egocentric too, right? I could have an egocentric vector cells, an egocentric movement, and this mechanism would also maybe give me egocentric, yes. the new egocentric vector cells. Um, Okay, and then and now I'm now I'm going to ask the question: well, What is the fundamental core idea here that allows that to happen? What is the thing you propose, which is really the the trick, uh, or like a module trick, or something like that, that allows this to happen? Um, I haven't internalized that yet. <laughs> so, I don't know if there's an easy explanation for that. Well, I, I guess I can try. I, I can try it. It starts with that I allow these modules to have not just a phase, but also a, a magnitude. And why does the magnitude make a difference in that case? What, what's, why does that trick work? What, what's, where does it come into the algorithm when you have that magnitude? Oh, because you need that. You need that to do your, your upper right hand picture here, right? You need a magnitude to, to have this ring attractor thing. Well, the, no, the the ring attractor. If you if it didn't have a magnitude, then you could. It could just be a phase. the The issue is that uh, if you if you didn't have magnitudes, then there would be no way to to reconstruct an image. In this case, the 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 image, the quote unquote pixels we're reconstructing are object vector cells. And there'd be no way to reconstruct those if you don't have magnitudes. For okay, all right. I, I hear you say that, but why? Uh, uh, how does the magnitude come into play? Can you just say, well, because if the cell is firing twice as much, then X happens. So, um, so if, if all of the magnitudes were the same, then these types of filters, um, you would you would have to add them all up, like uh, in in describing what this rep represents. You add up all these filters, the same amount. You weight this filter by one. You weight this filter by one. Add them all up, and what you're going to get is um, a, a a single. Oh oh oh! So the, the, okay, so so the magnitude represents. In some sense, the magnitude of the object vector cell. Is that what you're saying? It's like saying a magnitude of zero would say, oh, that, that there is no object that's yeah. application. Yeah, well, like for example, like if there's a boundary going diagonally like this next to you, that's going to be reflected in the magnitude. Got it. And if there's if there's not a boundary there at all, then um, then it's then of course the magnitude's gonna be um, zero. Okay, so in the past. All right, well, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. I mean, clearly, I mean, if a cell, if I have an object vector cell and there's nothing there, then it's not going to be fired, right? It's going to be, it's going to have, um, uh, so it's, um, and so why, why would it be a scalar though? I mean, you might say either the object is there or the object's not there. I mean, why do, why do we need a magnitude? Why, you know, what does it mean if it's half firing? You know, it's at half, it's at 0.5. <laughs> what does that mean? Because, because the goal of um, these cells is to work together to reconstruct the image, not to not to single-handedly do it, mm. and and so re reconstructing that the, like hey, there's an object here, there, and there, but not there, requires a population working together where they can each where some of them can be kind of on, some are responding vigorously. Well, you could, couldn't it also be like, a, you know, some are on, some are off? I mean, you could say the image is like, yes, I have objects at these locations, these locations, and those are all ones, and the other things are zero. Where am I adding things together at like 0.5 and 0.75? Why would I ever do that? Well, hmm. Maybe I have it's too simplistic an idea of an object vector cell. Um, So what what's going on here is very analogous to um, to I don't know maybe this will help you maybe it won't what's going on here is very analogous to representing a two D picture using uh, using the Fourier uh, yeah okay yeah and 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 basically like a fully capable Fourier transform with like with with magnitudes 
and with enough of these diagonal bars can reconstruct any image. Maybe that does make sense. I guess if I look at one of these filters, the, um, the filters have multiple bands in them, right? At least some of them do. So uh, if I, in some sense, the, each filter is, is not on its own going to tell you exactly what's out there, right? It, it could right. be multiple cases. So these are not these are not true object vector cells because Correct. If, if they were object vector cells, it would be, no, it's, it's object vector cells are just, it's here. It's not like here or here or here. Um, so these are, if then I can't really, I can, I, I, these are like object vector cells that are, that are toruses or <laughs> the ring, ring attractor or something like that. Um, and so, so, so then how would I actually get, because when we look at object vector cells, they don't appear to be like that, right? Object vector cells don't, they, they're not they're not like grid cells they're more like place cells they, they just they they activate but they don't activate in multiple locations right so they would have to be a readout of multiple rings yeah so these all right so these these filters aren't really a set of object vector cells they no. are a basis set from which i could somehow create a set of object vector cells yes in, in some sounds you're saying these are like these are like grid cells in the sense that they repeat and wrap around, um, but they're like object vector grid cells. <laughs> it's like, I could have a bar here or here or here, an object here or here or here relative to me. I don't know which one, uh, but if I have a bunch of them, uh, I'll know exactly what everything is. Um, it's the same with grid cells, right? Grid cells say, I'm at this location, this location, this location, I know where I am, but if I have a bunch of grid cell modules, then I can say, oh yeah, I know where I am. Um, is that a good analogy? Yes. Is that, okay. Do we have any evidence that the brain actually has repeating object cells, object vector cells? Is there is there evidence for that at all? Well, I'm not arguing for that. I'm not oh, arguing. For, I, I, I'm saying the, these are these are grid cells, and I'm showing how um, how object vector cells could be reconstructed from grid cells. Oh, you're saying these are grid cells? I thought you said these are like object. You interpreted that green bar saying there's an object over there at a diagonal. Each pixel would be denoting that there is an object vector cell at each pixel would be saying there is a an object here. But that's not a grid cell. The, this is a 1D grid cell. The, the, uh, this filter shows a this pair of filters leads to a ring that is a one way one a one D grid cell. All right. So the filter itself is not a grid cell, obviously, because it's not it's not denoting location. It's denoting an object relative to me. Right. Um, that's not a grid cell. So uh, oh, this language is getting me confused, Marcus. I'm sorry. Um, I wonder if it'd be interesting to have a visualization where you literally cr created those 1D modules up top and then showed the animal kind of moving around at the bottom, you know, the, the thing and see how that's changing. And you would see those things going around and around in a, in a circle. I mean, the grid cells would be the actual dots in the ring module up top. Right. Right. Um, each of those would be a 1D grid cell. Yeah, so the filters are not grid cells, right? A second ago, I thought you said they were. The, the, the two of these filters together lead- Oh, together, they could lead to a grid cell. Yeah. yeah. So, well, they represent a whole module, I think. Yeah, they represent-, they represent yeah, 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 you could read out different, different weights. Different cells with different weights would read out. Um, I think, you know, Mark, I feel like you're really onto something here, but I, 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 sometimes it's happened in the past. I feel like there's a, there's sort of a, some sort of mismatch between the way you're thinking about it and the way I'm thinking about it. Uh, and, and so I'm, and I, I'm not, I think it's just, I need to bridge that, I'm not, I'm not putting any, it's just as much my issue as your issue, perhaps or both, maybe all my issue. So I'm just trying to, that's why I keep asking these questions. I'm trying to like get a better interpretation of what you're saying here. Marcus, um, is there some reason why you're using quads of image uh, filter images rather than just uh, uh, quadrature pairs? 
Uh, yeah, the I mean, maybe that was just a faulty visualization. I could have put these further down. That they're, they're not actually quads. I just okay. That was just how I fit them into the slide. Okay, thank you. What are they then? They're just well, it's just pairs. They're just six pairs of they're cells. Just pairs. Uh, I see. Yeah. Like for this uh, picture, yeah. we removed the bottom three pairs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Is this is this suggesting that um, you you can create grid cell modules and update them by starting with starting with these object vector um, filters like these observed things? I, are you asking if, if there's empirical evidence for being? No, I, I guess I'm asking. Is that what this is suggesting? Again, I'm trying. I have this idea how grid cells work. Right. right, you know, and in some sense, the, the way the way we think about grid cells, you can think of them completely, almost completely independent of sensory input. I mean, once they get anchored, they basically path integrate. Of course, the path integration is very noisy, so they have to get re-anchored all the time. But in an ideal world, you can imagine that they don't need to get re-anchored mm -hmm. um, if it was perfectly accurate. But then we, so that's like one view of the world. Okay, yes, I have these. I have a bunch of grid cell modules updated by movement. I get app, put in a new movement. I know my new location. We have several reasons we know this not doesn't work. One is that they have to get re-anchored all the time. Two is the grid cells are actually distorted. Um, there's a bunch of reasons this doesn't work, but we I still in the back of my mind is the idea that that's how it basically works. And then the system is compensating somehow for noise and distortions, but think of it as a purely motor driven update of your location. But that could be wrong. That doesn't have to be right. It could be that that motor-driven updates to grid cells only works locally. Uh, it's a local phenomenon. They can use it temporarily for in a certain part of an environment, but that's not uh, how the whole system really works. And it's much more driven by sensory input. Um, that is, you're starting with a series of sensory inputs that um, that then it, you can do a prediction and do various calculations using grid cells, but it's not really being, but th that's not the, the backbone of the system. Like the way I hear it now is the grid cells are like the backbone of everything. They're the reference frame. Um, and that you're, you're getting sensory input to, to, to fill in the reference frame data and to update, you know, make sure the grid cells don't get lost. But the alternate view is it's, you know, it's more sensory driven and the grid cells are just sort of a, a local, path integration phenomena that works in some, in some places, but not everywhere. Um, and therefore your, your reference frame is sort of, it's discontinuous or at least it's not, it could be distorted, something like that. So I'm wondering if you're, if, if this is sort of coming at it from that way, like you're saying here, I have these, I have some sort of observations about the world and I can use those to, um, to learn grid cell behaviors and I can do some path integration within a certain realm but I'm, the system's really driven by sensory input. Did that, did that description, did that well, make sense I, to you? Yeah, I'm drawing a link to sensory input. A, a way I would say it is, um, so you, at the beginning of everything you just said, you said, you said that like the, the grid cells are anchored at the beginning. And then from that point forward, you can move and um, update them. Um, and in an ideal world, you could just update them endlessly and everything will stay in sync. Yeah. Uh, here I'm saying that same thing, um, you, you anchor the grid cells at the beginning, uh, but I'm no longer anchoring them randomly. I am doing it in a way that, that describes the surrounding environment. Doing it in a way that incorporates the object vector cells and the boundary vector cells. Uh-huh. And if I, if I dropped you randomly into two points in the new room, um, would this system anchor the grid cells the same way? Yes, in a compatible way. In, in, a, in a way that I would not, I wouldn't, I would say, oh, I know this is the same room, and therefore I know how to anchor the grid cells such that if I did path integration between the two points, it would work. Yes. All right, that is a, okay, that is a really big thing. That, it gets back to my, my conversation earlier about like, oh, I'm in a novel room, can I predict what my object vector cells would be in a big point in the room? 
this, this, so the, 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 the crux of this is not maybe it, I'm going to state this and see if you agree with it. The crux of this is something you just said that grid cells are not randomly um, anchored, which is an assumption we've had. It's not true. You're saying grid cells wouldn't be randomly anchored in this, in this thinking. Um, they're going to be anchored in a very way that's very specific to your sensory input. And therefore, I could be dropped into the same room from two different places, and I would anchor my grid cells in a compatible way that path integration would work between them. Yes. All right. That's, that may be the simplest explanation of what you're proposing here, and, and it's a big one. Because we had, we, and you're saying I can do that without having learned the, well, I still have to, I still have to, you, I guess I don't have to learn, I don't have to learn the room. I just have to see that the positions of objects are similar, um, or even though they're, in a, they're, they're somehow the same in the room's reference frame, even on the two different parts here. Um, I, I, so that's a, that would be, you know, that's, that, let's just rephrase it again. We, up to now, we've assumed that grid cells randomly, randomly anchor, and then you have to, but, uh, and then you build a model on, on top of that. And this model says, no, they don't randomly anchor. They're somehow, they're gonna be based on observation. Um, and, and if I were dropped into the same room in a different location, I would, I would even though I have different observations, I would, um, uh, I would anchor them correctly and be compatible. Yeah, within limits. Yeah. Course. like if you're if you're down the hallway too far away it's not going to work but if, if you yeah. some, you know if you have the site of the same boundaries but from a different uh different viewing location then yes yeah. so that's that's a really powerful idea but although you're assuming here that we have a good allocentric representation of object vector cells to begin with yes that's the input so, yeah. so they, they, they really begs need the question to agree. they really need to agree on head direction cells they really need to agree on you know your sense of direction uh that well, wouldn't, wouldn't they have to agree? I mean, I mean, I somehow, yeah, somehow I have to form a representation. Yeah, all right, all right. Obviously, if I'm dropped in some place and I have um, a bunch of uh, object vector cells and, and another place I have a bunch of object vector cells, if I was in different orientations and I didn't know that, that the whole thing would be messed up, right? Yes. Um, so how does that get resolved? Uh, I mean, my the the overall um, my overall mental model for that is that your head direction cells follow certain heuristics, like using the long axis of the room, and it just has almost a set of rules where where your head your your orientation system tries to just use a, a consistent set of rules so that no matter where you enter a room, it will be consistent. Yeah, you know, I, I've been thinking about this because you know orientation is a lot like the grid cell. I mean, I've mentioned this before. Um, you can do path integration with orientation. Like I can close my eyes and I can rotate my body a certain amount and I, I have a sense of how far I've rotated. I can predict what I'm gonna see. Um, and, um, and, so, um, and so we have this path integration. Um, there's an anchoring component to it. It's very analogous to grid cells, except that the, the, we're instead of uh, unfolding our torus or our, our, our ring linearly over long distances, we, we wrap around on itself. So 360 degrees you know, back to where I started from. Um, and yet, so the question then is because how does, you know, how does it get anchored? And, and, and you know, this idea that you pick these long distance things to look for, there's some evidence for that, but it still seems very weird to me. It just doesn't seem how sufficient somehow. It feels like almost like somehow you have to infer what your orientation is and not just base it on some simple observation. Like there could be many places where it's not obvious what the correct orientation is. So somehow you have to infer it. You have to figure yeah. out what your anchoring should be for the grid cell. So simultaneously you're figuring out what your orientation is as well as your location. <laughs> Both can be confused. You know what I'm saying? Um, okay. All right. I, well, I think, I think I've made some progress in understanding what you said today. Uh, uh, at least at a very, very high level for me. It's like, okay, we're, we're not gonna randomly pick, we may never randomly pick um, uh, anchoring points in modules that we're gonna do it on observations. We're gonna do that whether it's an orientation module, we're gonna do that whether it's a grid cell module that somehow 
observations are going to choose what our anchoring point is. And somehow you've magically made it work so that in a room with different objects, um, the room with objects, I would pick the copacetic anchoring points for different locations of the room based on observations. And I, I have to think about how you did that. <laughs> that, that, would be a, that would be a big win in my mind, uh, if that's what you've done. Yeah, that's, that's the motivation. Uh, so the last bullet point here, um, the, 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 the point I wanted to make, first I'll just read it and then say what I mean. So uh, th this was a simple linear mapping. It's a single set of weights. And so a multi-layer network or a recurrent network uh, will be more advanced. Um, it'll, it will use population codes and won't be the, it won't necessarily be these simple sine waves. What I'm saying here is that um, this, I'm not literally predicting that a grid cells, grid cells are going to respond to a boundary going diagonally like this. I mean, maybe they will, but, um, but in some ways, this is the reason you're seeing these sine waves like this is because I was go giving this the simple version of it. Um, if these rings are set by a non nonlinear feed forward network, it's, it's no, you're no longer going to have these just simple filters. It's, it's going to be more complicated. Um, Although the, you might still get a bunch of these simple filters. Possibly, yeah. But it won't be constrained to it. And, and, yeah. and it, like right, right now, each of these rings is sort of independent of all the others in the sense that like you can describe what this ring responds to. You can, resp you can describe what this ring responds to independently of each other. Uh, but once you add multiple layers of processing, they're kind of co-linked. They're kind of, um, you, you can't really describe what just one response to in isolation. And uh, that's, uh, that might not help this presentation because I'm making things more confusing, but it's just like, this is the simple version and the system changes once you ha have multiple layers or if you add recurrence to this layer where, it's, the, where this, the linear filters are no longer um, the exact truth. Maybe this didn't help my presentation because I just added more confusion. But um, but but I do think that like a realistic version of this is not going to use a linear mapping here. And grid cells probably aren't just a linear mapping of the surrounding head direction cells. There's something a little more complicated than a linear mapping. Is anything you is anything you presented here suggest how the allocentric, egocentric to allocentric transformation will occur. So these are everything you've phrased here so far is all in sort of L-centric or object centric. Right. Uh, no, no, I haven't taken a stand on that. This, this all, like, like you said earlier in the presentation, all these mechanisms can work in either. It can work in egocentric yeah. or it can work in allocentric. But um, I did, I hadn't, haven't stated anything about the so, so the reason I asked this, and I've said this many times ago, but you come forward, but this conversion from one reference frame to another has to occur and I believe it has to occur in every cortical column all right because it's going to occur anywhere it's going to occur multiple places in the cortex so it's going to occur everywhere in the cortex so this makes sense so v1 has to somehow make some movement maybe not complete but some movement from an, a pure egocentric perhaps reference frame to a, a less egocentric reference frame um, maybe it makes it all in one fell swoop which is the way I've been thinking about it. Maybe there's some sort of intermediate phases that takes in, maybe, I don't know. But at least it has to be some amount of ego to allo, it has to be occurring in every column. And maybe a complete ego to allo occurs in every column. That would be nice. Well, so uh, like, are you 100% are you attached to that? Or occasionally we brought up the idea that some columns are ego and some are allo. Uh, you maybe that's the what and where distinction. We we don't know, but that that's well. I'm totally confined to the idea that each column does a reference frame transform. So, for example, in a in a in a uh, aware column, you might be doing a transform from a, a fingers reference frame to a to a hands reference frame, or you might be doing a ref. Uh, you might be doing a reference frame from your eyes orientation in your head to your eyes orientation to your body. Um, so uh, it's less about ego and allo. It's more about there's a reference frame transformation that occurs in every column. And I'm pretty wedded to that. That that one's I feel strongly about. It. The allo ego thing is is it can be applied to lots of different 
things, but a reference frame transformation, I think, has to occur um, everywhere. Uh, and so, again, I hope those examples were clear that you know you can be doing between multiple different egocentric reference frames. Um, and other people have written about that. You know, like they just point out that when you you know when you move your muscles of your arm and your fingers, it's a gazillion of trans transformations that have to be uh, done. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, um, and so just to, to know where every part is relative to every other part, or just to know where your finger is relative to your head, right? You know, that's, that's to know where my finger is relative to my nose requires my finger relative to my hand, my hand relative to my arm, you know, all these things. So something like that. So yeah, I'm wedded to that idea. Um, so anyway, the point what I'm getting at here is, okay, so uh, I, I think, um, that's a, to me a really key problem here. How you do that, and um, and I just was wanting to know if uh, uh, if you had addressed it here, you hadn't. No. Um, um, but I think I think we have to somehow do it. So um, um, I'll have to think about that if I can sort of think about what you're suggesting here. Um, um, uh, Kevin's saying something. Kevin I sent a link because uh, one of the oh. things that's suggestive of this uh, for me is that there's there's a trick, and you may may have seen it already, Marcus. That if you take a Fourier transform of two images and uh, basically take the magnitude, swap the magnitudes of the two images, fundamentally it doesn't change. All the information, most of the information, ceiling information is in the phase part of the of the image. Um, and so when I, I see these guys contributing, you know, these axes and quadrature to that, that phase information, you know, contains a lot of interesting information and you're showing examples of things, pairs, you're saying it might not be a linear mapping, but the fact that you're combining these things in a way that is indicative of like a phase relationship means that you can embed a lot of information, uh, that's, that's important. Um, it's a question of, you know, do you, does the brain find this encoding way of using this encoding of information uh, importantly? I think that what you're, what you're trending toward is, is something that's important of how do you take these 1D things and, and get, you know, these, these, these relationships, these phase relationships to things. So um, I, 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 I find it, you know, evocative because of what I see in Fourier transforms. Um, so, so I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm at least aesthetically pleased with what you're doing. Uh, I'll look at what you linked to, cause that, that is interesting sounding like maybe, maybe we don't, maybe we can have very coarse magnitudes or may we can actually see how, how necessary the magnitudes actually are. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all these ideas floating through my head. Um, does anyone else want to talk further about this? What do you want to do next, Marcus? This is always what happens. Uh, the hard part is choosing exactly what to do next because uh, I have like a whole list of a list of ideas. One one thing that seems like um, that this is lacking is the, the fact that the grid cells are set from the instantaneous input um, that this this system's not going to handle ambiguity really it's gonna if, if you give the system at um, identical input at two times it's going to activate the identical output and so so something that does incorporate time into inference is going to um, it's a big to do item. So that's, that's a hard task that's in front of me and I'm deciding whether that's the right next step. Mm -hmm. Another, another task is like the, this thir third bullet point is the most confusing part of this because I haven't, um, I haven't tried it out and, and figuring out how to like fl flesh out this third bullet point and make it into something that I can explain to everyone and, and demo it. Uh, I, 
it, it's sort of this is a big unknown and I think exploring this space is also important. Um, one, I guess one thing on the topic of what to do next is that a lot of this I'm, I'm sort of living in machine learning land still. Like the, the fact that I represented all of this using these two units, use backprop, use this loss function, interpret this as a bunch of rings. Uh, so, so one question on what to do next, or uh, one one point of view is that like I'm kind of doing it in the machine learning world while while still like maintain while ma maintaining a grip on neuroscience. And so what? So I, I I'm bringing that up because you could come in with the perspective of like, no, it's time to dive deeper into the neuroscience and you know, take a focus, start implementing these rings instead of these. Uh, and right now I'm more on the side of, I think I can get more done by living in the machine learning world and analyzing this technique from that end. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's more just a discussion topic on the, on what to do next. Well, I think, uh, go ahead. yeah, I was, I was gonna say, it seems like the, the real kind of the core powerful idea here is that novel environments together with locations can be represented using this, you know, some encoding scheme like this, right? And it's not clear to me that you've fully shown that yeah. can happen well. And it seems like whatever you can do to really show that working well would be great. You know, whether, I'm not sure whether you really need multi-layer networks or not to do it, but, um, and then from there being able to show the predictive nature of this um, it seems like those are two really powerful ideas. Yeah. Or this it, encoding scheme. And it seems like it, that, that seems like a key thing here. Are you real? I, you know, when you said that phrase earlier, you said it again, Subitai, like, oh, you're representing these novel environments. I, it, it, didn't, it didn't work for me. It, what worked for me is this idea that, that I can anchor my grid cells, uh, that, that they're not randomly anchored. They're, they're anchored based on and, yeah, um, we could use that. That's that's the same. I think to me those are the same, but we can use that. Okay. Well, too. to one, yeah. the, I it was there was a lot of ambiguity in the in the phrase that you and Marcus used, at least in my mind. Uh, I didn't understand what it meant, but this I can concretely understand now. I can say, oh, that's more precise. Saying. Yeah, the way you're saying it is more precise. I think. So I know what that means now. Um, yeah. I just just uh, I just throw out an observation, Marcus, uh, that to think about what I've. I used to, when we were in the office, I used to talk about this. I'd say, oh, I, I walk into a, a conference room I've never been in before, and I quickly look around. And, um, and now uh, if I, I and I've, just what I said earlier, I could then close my eyes, I could walk to a different part of the, the room and I can picture what I would see. Um, and um, I think that is what you meant by learning a novel room I, or something like that. It's, it's, it's like, I, I from, essentially, I, I not only I know if I, I not only know where I am in the room when I walk, my eyes are closed, and I not only know where, where I am in the room, but I can also visualize what's in the room, what my viewpoint would be from this point. So clearly, I've built some sort of model of the room um, to allow me to do that. But this idea that that the observations initially are 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 do not lead to random grid cell assignments. Uh, it's very that's the key thing I think you said here. Um, and, and that's part of this solving this problem. But, but the observation I wanted to make, here, here's the observation I wanted to make, I'm sorry, I got off track. Uh, when I walk into the room, I just don't open my eyes and take a glance and close them. I literally have to attend the different objects in the room. I, I, I think I have to do that. I, I can't just like take a picture and go bing, open shut. I have to say, oh, there's a chair, there's this and this. And as I do this, I'm somehow, I see where these things are relative to me. I clearly form a representation where the chair is relative to me and where the table is relative to me and where the coffee pot is relative to me. Um, and, and so th this, this, it's not a snapshot. It's a, it's, I'm, I'm building up something by looking at multiple things in their position relative to me. And, and so my point is, what you're, it's not like I just have an image that's a, a flash. It's like I have to go through a series of observations of the different components in the room um, to, to get to that representation that allows me to do this. And, and so somehow you might think about that issue here too. I, I'm just pointing out, I, you just said, said some, a moment ago where you said, well, this is like a, a single image. And from that, I can do all this. I, I, in the biology, I don't think that's the case. In biology, I think we have to somehow construct something. 
um, through multiple observations. Uh, that allows me to, um, that, that, that somehow allows me to anchor my grid cells or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, I, I'm going to shut up. I'm just rambling here. I, the big takeaway again for me is no random grid cell anchoring. Yeah. <laughs> That's the big takeaway. Yes, yeah, so I, I would suggest use that as a, a sorting function for the different things you're thinking of trying. Like, what would really show that property well? Um, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a very powerful idea. And in hindsight, it almost seems like it has to be true. You know, it's like, oh, that's pretty likely true. <laughs> now that you mentioned it, it's like, oh, yeah, it almost has to be true. Um, uh, so I like that. It strikes me as like, oh, yeah, okay, that's a good idea. Now, you, you've got a mechanism here. I don't quite understand it if I don't think about it. Um, I think maybe the next time you present this, I may be able to understand the mechanism in the context of that uh, phrasing of the problem. Yeah. Right. That's helpful. Okay, I think we're done.